Now we're going to start talking about public sector economics. Rough outline of what's to come. We're going to talk about things called public goods. We're going to talk about Adam Smith's view of the government. Then we're going to get into modern ideas like public choice theory and talk about spending and taxes in the real world. This will take us a bunch of videos. So what's a public good? Let's start by talking about a sunset. A sunset has a property that we call non-rivalous. What that means is that I can take in the view of that sunset, and you can come along and take in the view of that sunset, and nothing diminishes. You looking at that sunset, whether there's one person or ten people or a million people watching that sunset, it's all the same. Most goods are rivalous. If I have a burrito and I eat the burrito, you can't eat the burrito. That's rivalous. Sunsets are not rivalous. We all can watch that sunset, and just the fact that I consume it doesn't make it dimmer for you. We all get to see the beautiful sunset. There's another property we want to talk about, and that's called non-exclusive. National defense is a good that is non-exclusive. Once we provide it, everybody gets it. There's no way... Well, I suppose we could send the terrorists a list and go, hey, these people here didn't pay their taxes, you can go ahead and bomb them. But realistically speaking, once we're defending our country, we're defending our country, and everybody gets the benefit of that defense. Just like everybody gets the benefit of criminals knowing police are driving around your neighborhood. It doesn't matter whether you paid your fees or not. Out of this comes something called public good. A public good is both of those things we've described. It's non-rivalous. Everybody can consume it and one person's consumption doesn't take away from another's. And two, it's non-exclusive. Once it exists, we can't stop you from using it. So non-rivalous and non-exclusive. Anything that meets those things is a public good. There are a number of other things that are one or the other, that have some characteristics of public goods. And we'll talk about those because they have some of the same issues. Now, the problem with a public good is the market doesn't work on it. And the reason markets don't work on public goods is really simple. If I provide national defense and the government says, look, we're going to spin this off, and when your tax form comes, just send us what you want to send us for national defense. Well, some people are going to do that, but some people are going to hope that you do it so they don't have to, and some folks are going to try to get their outcome, try to get the thing they want, which is to have national defense, but they want to get it without having to pay for it. A simple, another simple example would be, think about the Hudson River, which is in between New York and New Jersey. How do we clean it up? Anyway, anyway, people who get the thing but don't pay are called free riders. If you live in America, you're protected, but you don't pay any taxes somehow, you're free riding on the rest of us. Free riders. And then there's a lot more examples of this. Because there are free riders, markets are going to underproduce public goods. They're going to produce too little. You want national defense but you're hoping to not pay for it, and other people will pay for it, so you don't put in as much as you want. New York and New Jersey. If New Jersey can get New York to clean up the river, then they benefit from it without having to pay for it. If New Jersey cleans up the river, 
New York gets the benefit of having the Clean River without having to pay for it. So it's likely that if the two sides never talk to each other, if the two states never talk to each other, the river is not going to get cleaned up. Because even though both sides want it, they're going to try to free ride, and because of that, we will underproduce the good. So what I'm saying is we won't have enough defense and police and other such things if we leave it to the marketplace because people will free ride. The air will not get cleaned up. The water pollution will not get cleaned up because people will try to free ride. Adam Smith, our old buddy Adam Smith, wrote in 1776, and he said that the government should provide three basic things, and that's national defense, police, and courts. Those are really basic public goods, and Adam Smith viewed those as the role of the government. If you read his book, he does say, for example, that the government should provide education. And the reason that the government should pay for education is our magic econ word, externalities. If we have a well-educated population, if kids grow up and they have a good education and when they graduate from high school they can do math and write and read and all that, they can go to work for businesses and the businesses don't have to train them. The businesses don't have to train them to make change or to read a receipt or something. If you go to college and you become an accountant, an accounting firm can hire you and you already have accounting skills. That's a benefit to society. It's a benefit to businesses. Your education benefits more than just you. It benefits your employers. It benefits society as a whole. So the value of education is bigger than the cost. And again, we won't have enough education if we leave it to the market to provide. The other thing that Adam Smith said the government should do is to fund large projects. So there are highway projects and bridges and things that are just too big and too expensive for any private sector person to put on. There's no way the Golden Gate Bridge is going to get built by the private sector because there's too much hassle in who owns the the ends of the roads and who owns the ocean. And There are large projects in Adam Smith's view They can only get done if the government gets them done. So again, modern economists have a lot of theories that revolve around this idea of market failure. And one of the big disagreements in our world today is what's the responsibility of government to deal with market failure? There are people who will tell you that Even when the market's not working right, it still works better than the government works, and we should still rely on the market for these things. There's other people who point out the the flaws of market failure and suggest that those flaws are fairly large sometimes, and the government needs to be involved, that there has to be some kind of joint action for that to work. So most economists, again, not even all economists, but most economists agree the government should provide those basic public goods. There are questions about these things called common property resources and other market failures, and that's the question. Does the government need to get involved in those? Number one market failure is what we call asymmetric information. Again, we've talked about this before. What if buyers and sellers don't have the same information? Many states, for example, have what are called lemon laws. They have laws that require you to do certain things if you sell a used car to someone. That minimizes the chance that people are going to get ripped off. It doesn't eliminate the chance that people are going to get ripped off, but it lessens the chance that people are going to get ripped off because the seller knows that the buyer can come back and say, give them the car back within two weeks if it turns out to be a lemon. Nevada, by the way, doesn't have any of those laws. Nevada doesn't have a lot of consumer protection laws. The same thing with, for example, the Food and Drug Administration. When you go buy a steak in the store, that steak from the point where it was a cow to the point where it shows up 
in your grocery store has been inspected by the government and the processing plants it's been in have been inspected by the government and you can be fairly certain not entirely certain obviously but fairly certain that that piece of meat is safe to eat sometimes it's not sometimes your romaine lettuce is not but again the government is out there letting you know that certain kinds of lettuce or certain kinds of meat made in certain factories you shouldn't eat and the grocery stores will pull that from the shelf and shopping is much more safe than it was 120 or 30 or 40 years ago if you went shopping for meat in new york in 1900 there was about a hundred percent certainty that there was meat in the stores there that would kill you if you ate it and that's generally not true anymore it'll kill you but it'll take 30 or 40 years number two is common property and that's why i put the fish up there Again, we've talked about common property before. Think about the Alaskan Pollock. The Alaskan Pollock was almost wiped out. You have this fish, and it mostly lives off the coast of Alaska, which Alaskan Pollock lives off the coast of Alaska. It was being fished by Americans and Russians and Japanese fishermen because it was swimming in what was international waters. They could all get it. If you know that you can fish these fish, that whatever fish you catch belong to you, and at the same time, everybody else who's fishing knows that those fish belong to them, all of you recognize that if you fish too much, you're going to wipe out the fish, but at the same time, there's no way for you to be all working together are all smart enough to not fish if you all make an agreement let's say there's 10 fisher people and nine of you make an agreement that you're only going to get 100 pounds of fish each well fine what about the last person or even all 10 of you make that agreement the more restrictive an agreement you make the tighter an agreement you make the more advantage there is the more money to be made by cheating on it and people would cheat on it common property resources like fish require joint action for us to protect them what happened in the case of the pollock is the united states pushed its fishing boundary out from 12 miles to 200 miles that pushed the russians and japanese out of our fishing zone so it was only u.s fishermen then we started counting the fish. And I have a mental vision of a guy in a rowboat going, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue. But somehow they count the fish. Okay? And then having counted the fish, they allow the fisher people to hunt, to capture 15% of the fish that are swimming in the ocean. And once those fish have been captured, they have to stop. So you, anybody can go fish, and the better fisher you are, the more fish you get. They get out of that Atlantic, out of that Pacific fishery, which was almost dead. Today they get more than 10 billion pounds of fish a year. That is the most productive fishery in the world now, because everybody worked together to protect it. And then our old friend externalities. What happens when people make a transaction and somebody else is negatively affected by it or positively affected by it? Externalities mean that people aren't paying the true cost of their actions. I dump pollution into the air. You breathe it. I'm not paying the true cost of my pollution. You're paying some of the cost of my pollution. We will not clean up the pollution because I don't see the advantage in doing that because I'm getting away with something now because of the externality. Right? New York and New Jersey are not going to clean up that river independently. Somebody has to get them together and make them clean up the river. What do we do about free riders? Well, we try to create incentives and other mechanisms so that they don't free ride. It's very difficult to do. And we'll talk about this more as time goes on. 
So we're going to get more complicated now. Do a little econ. 